So what is digital technology that, that all this buzz is about, the, the driving force of current societal evolution? Well, another name for it is ICT, information communication technology, but information communication technology not necessarily is digital and actually has an extremely long trajectory and also in its social construction, in the social construction, the role it has played. For example, 350 years before Christ, so that's like, what, 2,400 years ago almost, uh, Aristotle, famously in Greek, argued that democracy could impossibly go beyond a, a distance of 70 kilometers. That's about 45 miles because information couldn't travel any faster. So how could you have democracy? That's a communication exchange beyond a city. So Athens, that, that was it. Democracy could impossibly go beyond that because, I mean, that's like, 45 miles, it's 70, that's almost two marathons, right? This thing that's called an ultra marathon. That is pretty much exhausting. And how could you have a vibrant democracy uh, beyond that? Obviously, uh, that changed with the evolution of information and communication technology. In 1860, information was traveling at the speed of a horse's breath. With the Pony Express, we crossed our big country here, the United States of America. And when Abraham Lincoln was elected president in 1860, we here in California didn't know who was president for seven days and 17 hours. That was when the newspapers on the East Coast had published who is president. And it took another 70, so more than a week for a young, skinny, wiry fellow, uh, not over 18, to jump on a horse and, and cross the entire leg. That's as fast as information could travel. Then, but democracy was implemented way beyond what Aristotle could ever imagine, just didn't imagine. And then during the same time with uh, the telegraph, uh, the, the imagination grew wings. The world of matter has become a great nerve vibrating thousands of miles in a breathless point of time. Rather, the round globe is a vast head, a brain, instinct with intelligence, because of a telegraph. That was like, dit, 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 Morse code. You know, like that, that's okay. That's uh, how far they are. Or then when Graham Bell, 1876, uttered the first phrases through his telephone, the Scientific American, still a very popular science publication, was so excited that it said the scattered members of civilized communities will be as closely united as far as instant communication is concerned as the various members of the body are now by the nervous system. So, wow, that was, again, that was the telephone of Graham Bell that you could hardly understand. But if we look at today's digital a communication landscape, and that started in the 1940s, 1950s, then yes, this, this anal analogies are quite apt, actually, and it has progressed over the last hundred years, and it has progressed almost to that, well, well actually beyond that point in quantitative uh, measures. So if you go to the three basic things that you can do with information, store, communicate, and compute, we can see that all the world storage devices combined can store more information than the cells, the 60 trillion cells of a human body can store. More like right now, maybe 2000 human bodies. And similar to the brain, all general purpose computers combined can do more instructions per second as the brain of about one or two thousand, a couple of thousand people uh, can do nerve impulses per second, at least qu uh, quantitatively. And the global communication networks shuffle send more bits around per second as the human circulatory system sends blood cells around per second, actually of several thousand people combined. And, and that just happened in the last 15 or 20 years that our technology, our information technology has caught up to these mind boggling orders of magnitude with which mother nature processes information in order to create life. And we can see these 
great headlines that I just showed you from several hundred years ago, still, you know, still being published nowadays. And, you know, we worked on it for the last hundred years and digital technology really had a big impact on that. Now, I never said that, that the world's total CPU power is, is, is a human brain, but we are getting to these orders of magnitude and digital technology certainly has done that in a historical blink of an eye. So if you go back here to, to the last century, this is still the analog information in the world, all the information that's stored in the little green here is the digital. And you can see even in the 1990s, it was nothing. After the year 2000, it started to explode. It doesn't mean that there's less analog information in the world. There's still a lot of technologically stored information on paper and the paperless office never came uh, to become a reality as we all know with our printers, addiction to printers and so forth. But the vast majority of information nowadays, is just digital has grown, has grown so much. So, and that really happened. In, in a blink of an eye. Digital technology was conceptualized in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s. And we estimate the beginning of the digital age to be 2002, when for the first time, the world could store more digital information, had more capacity to store digital information and analog information. And by now, it's way over 99%. I mean, I, I would have really liked it to be the year 2000, the beginning of the digital age, but hey, that's how science works. That's what we found. And, uh, 2002 is also good to remember, right? So that's that's where that's where we determine. So that's not too long ago. It's a historical blink of an eye from a very young technology that really grew at an impressive rate. So over these, let's say, the 20 years around the change of the millennia, uh, storage and communication and computation has grown at double digit rates: 25 percent, 30 percent, 60 percent per year. Usually, social change population grows at you know one less than one percent a year and we say that is goes very very fast because it's exponential you got to be careful with that the economy what does it grow 1.5 percent on average if it grows sometimes it doesn't grow we call that recession and some they, they grow two three percent oh wow wow three four percent like that is very, and this has been growing over 20 years this was the decisive time where we basically digitalized the world's information and communication stockpile. And that started very recently. Claude Shannon, a mathematician and engineer, single-handedly <laughs> invented the digital age. And that is one of these crazy science stories where, where one person, basically, in, a, in one paper, actually it's a two-part paper, in 1948 he published it, and he called it very hum humbly, Mathematical Theory of Communication. Actually, it's the... <laughs> Mathematical theory of communication, but he was a very humble guy. And he single-handedly single conceptualized the bit. And with the bit, basically conceptualized the unit of information. And with that, all other information converged on that. There's a very interesting book that if you're interested in this really amazing science and crazy science story around Claude Shannon, I invite you to, to check it out from from Gleek, The Information, A History, a, a Theory, A Flood, very nicely written and, and it's extremely interesting to understand how the digital age came about so recently, not, not, very, not very many decades ago. Now, the bid is so convincing, so, so useful as a unit of information that all previous information communication technology converged on it. We call, we call it the digital convergence on the bit. So communication, for example, starting with smoke signals. I mean, when, when was that? And a, a newspaper, the telegraph, of course, any kind of telephony, radio, television broadcasting was a lot of one-way communication. Uh, and, and then mobile telephony as well. Same as storage. And that goes all the way back to cave paintings. I mean, that was the first information storages that we had, technological information storages, and that goes to the origin of humanity. Printing press, of course, really changed the course of history, talking about social construction of, of reality, and then all the different tapes that we had. And computation too, the abacus, I mean, that's more than 5,000 years old, that computer, uh, basically. And, uh, and then all kind of different calculating devices that we have used also converged on the bit, so computation, communication, storage. So communication is the transmission of data, of information through space. Storage, 
is the transmission of information through time. And since Einstein, we actually know space and time are you know, pretty, some physicists just interchange them. So the engineering aspect has some similarities. And computation is the transformation of information in space and time, the Turing machine. And we will talk more about how that works. Now, the theoretical conceptualization of how the bit is used in computation comes from another mathematician. During the Cold War, they didn't really talk to each other because it's a Russian mathematician called Andrei Kolmogorov and is known as Kolmogorov complexity. And of course, then this continues here, this evolution has continued and is still continuing and it's converging and evolving. But still these three information through space, through time and the transformation is keeping going on. In this exploration, we will talk about these innovations. Just pick these three just to show you that this is still ongoing, the blockchain, the metaverse, and of course, generative uh, artificial intelligence. But it's very important for me to understand, for you to understand that it works both with information and with computation. The bit is the key of the digital age. So if we go to our application of this paradigm to social evolution, and I said that digital technology is the driving force of our current social evolution or progress, whatever you call it. I said we're already in the second meta paradigm, same as you know, steam came after water and the Iron Age came after the Bronze Age came after the Stone Age. Also here, we first focused on communication and data. That's the transformation of information through space, communication, and time, storage. So we digitalized the world's information stockpile and, and communicated it, created an infrastructure, and now we are transforming it. We are learning how to transform it with technology. This is often known as artificial intelligence, which mainly is driven by machine learning. We'll get, we'll get to, to all of that. But it's important for me to, to communicate to you that this is both based on the bit. The bit is the key of the digital age. And, and this is how these two gentlemen conceptualized it. This is now a little theoretical excursion, but, and, and it's very like, this is my mathematical workhorse. That's the theory I work with as a scientist. I work with information theory, obviously, the, the mathematical theory of no, of information and communication as conceptualized by Claude Shannon and, and, and with many innovations afterwards. And what Claude Shannon basically said is that information is the opposite of uncertainty. I mean, that, that makes sense. You don't have to be a mathematician for that, right? I mean, if you have uncertainty, you don't have information. And if I give you information, what happens to uncertainty? Well, it gets reduced. Right. I mean, I give you a lot, give you a lot of information, then you don't have uncertainty anymore. So he said, "Well, if we can we can measure uns we can measure uncertainty with probabilities. Hence, we can measure the other side of the coin, which is information. So basically, it's a probabilistic theory where he measures information as the reduction of uncertainty. How much uncertainty do you reduce? And if you reduce uncertainty by half, he said, "Well, that's that's one bit." So one bit, it also depends, you know, you have probably a different uncertainty than I have. It's a very subjective, it's a genius, genius theory, information theory, as conceptualized by Claude Shannon. Now, what Kolmogorov came up with a, a few years later, it says, well, the same bit can actually help to create algorithmic information. An algorithm is basically a recipe, and we will talk much more about algorithms, which are extremely important, the basis also of computer science, where you base an algorithm as a recipe that describes something. And I can, for example, now say, well, I have something here. I have some information, and I can compute this information, or I can communicate this information for you. And Shannon always referred to the game of 20 questions, so I say, I think about a city in the United States, and I think about it. Now, I have two ways of communicating to you or computing to you what that city is. I can reveal it to you by reducing uncertainty. And if you play that game well, you always reduce uncertainty by half. That's the most efficient way. That means you communicate one bit. So you can say, well, is it on this side or that side of the Mississippi? 
right? Is it north or south? And, and then you reduce uncertainty by half. And at the end, I tell you, well, the city is, I don't know, it's Los Angeles or San Francisco or it's New York or whatever city I had in mind. And I reduce the uncertainty by half many times. So Shannon called it the game of 20 questions. I mean, with 20 questions, if you reduce uncertainty by half, you can pick out one out of a list than more than a million different cities. So you can, in, in the United States, you can get to, to every city you want to get. But I could also compute the answer. How do I do that? Well, I give you a recipe of how to drive to the city. And it turns out that the number of bits I need on average to describe how to drive to that city that I have in mind, let's say I have San Francisco in mind, is on average, asymptotically, the same number of bits I need to communicate the city to you. And that also kind of like makes sense if, if you think about it. So in the words of Coven Thomas, the authors of the standard textbook and information theory, they say, it is an amazing fact that the expected length of the shortest binary computer description or random variable is approximately equal to its entropy. Entropy is the measure of probabilistic information. And in the words of Lee and Vitanji, the authors of the uh, leading textbook on Kolmogorov complexity, they say it's a beautiful fact that these two notions turn out to be much the same. That means that informational bits and knowledge bits are on average, you need, you need the same, you can reveal it or you can describe it, but it's kind of like the same amount that you need, two, two sides of a coin. Then and, and, and think about it like, just to give you another example. So for example, I can say like, okay, I have information here. I have this animal and what I have in mind is an elephant. Now I have two options. I can reveal it. I can identify this animal from all non-elephants. Most animals are non-elephants and I can communicate it to you like that. Or I can describe the elephant bit by bit. And the amazing and beautiful fact is that they turn out to be the same notion. So, But first we had to learn as humanity how to deal with information, how to communicate, to reveal it. And now we are learning how to compute, how to describe, how to generate, create uh, these things. And look, when hardcore mathematicians, like these textbook authors, and these are really mathematical, I mean, there are more equations in there than sentences probably. Uh, and when they get almost like teary-eyed and use words like amazing and beautiful, then the rest of us have to listen. You know, this is really, I mean, this is a, a really amazing uh, theorem that they come together. And it's currently, uh, I wanted to show you as well, the science behind it. It's not very old, the science is not very old. It's from the 19. 40s, 1960s, when these, uh, these fundamental theories have been worked out. And these are the mathematical results that we build the information society and the knowledge society on. So if you're up for it in your free time, I, of course, strongly invite you to, to study that or maybe in grad school, because this is the scientific language that also I use, and that's, that is the scientific language, the mathematical description of what the digital paradigm is actually based on. It is a very concrete theoretical background. Now, we will not go through that in this course. In this course, we will talk about the social construction of these theoretical results. But I wanted to start also to say that, yes, uh, both information and knowledge have mathematical theories behind them, really serious ones. I mean, these textbooks, they are really big, and these are the standard textbooks only. 